Okay, so my talk slash demo is half talk, half demo. Um, I wanted to talk about nesting. I've already recorded a video about task scaler and you kind of know maybe a little bit about fleeting, but I wanted to talk specifically about nesting and about um, cloud hypervisor, which Aaron has been poking around with. Uh, so I'm going to kind of, and I want to show how this relates to our executor structure. So I kind of, I'm going to do a really high level kind of view of like how I see this um, problem space evolving and simplifying, hopefully. And then I wanted to go all the way to the very bottom and show you how the code actually represents those abstractions, show you where those abstractions actually happen in the runner code base, where you jump from one thing to the next, because ultimately like we're going to have to debug this. You're going to need to get in and like, kind of have some sense of where you actually make changes to, to affect these things. So yeah, um, I'm going to start with where does nesting fall into this picture? So I can't really give you a picture on the command line. So I'm, I made a PDF. And let me make this a little bigger here. So this is kind of what our various job environments looked like before all the fleeting stuff. You've got GitLab, runner connects to GitLab, right? And then it decides based on this executor um, discriminator, how it's gonna set stuff up, right? And you basically, the executor determines the whole path there. Either you run it locally, in shell, or if you're using Kubernetes, that means it's gonna make a call to Kubernetes and Kubernetes is gonna make multiple pods and the pods are gonna run the thing, right? Or with the custom executor, this example is about Windows SaaS. Custom executor can do anything you want, but you know we had this whole separate autoscaler that we built that creates instances, which all in those instances also provide VM isolation, which run the thing. Docker machine is this whole other like auto scaler that does pretty much the same thing, but also you runs things in Docker, et cetera. And there's not really like a way to get, for example, auto scaling for shell or a different isolation mechanism for uh, Docker machine. You know, like, like this, this isn't really like, this is a, a one dimensional matrix. You get what you get from each, from each executor. Um, the direction that we're kind of going with this is something more like this. So this is actually kind of a, there's a lot, there's a lot going on, but let me talk you through this a little bit. There's separate considerations here for the runner with the fleeting system and task scaler. It uses task scaler to auto scale, but have like one auto scaler for all of these plugins. And these plugins adapt to various like places you can get capacity, right? Static is one maybe you haven't heard of, but it just means a static list. It doesn't actually auto scale. So um, it's not exactly, it's scale of some sort or like environment management. Then there's isolation. Um, and so like each one of these, you know, we can make as many of these as it wants. So you see like the auto scaling is sort of represented over here. You don't need isolation at all, or you can use parallels, virtualization framework, out, uh, cloud hypervisor, or whatever. And then once you find yourself in the environment, you can just run your thing like you own it. That's the instance executor, or start a Docker container. And there's another there's another path here where, with a different executor, you can you know we kept the Kubernetes the way that it was already. Kubernetes executor. But there's also another way that you can get runner jobs running on Kubernetes. In the video, how to build a fleeting plugin, the toy plugin that I created was a Kubernetes plugin, where it actually treats pods more like instance executors. So like what it does is you have a job, it calls cakes, makes a pod, and then just runs the thing inside that pod. Um, and there's actually a contributor, I just discovered this last week, there's a contributor that is making a um, Kubernetes plugin based on stateful sets. So there's, there's some interesting things that we can do. And what's nice about this is there's one kind of auto scaling in one place. Uh, isolation actually has one interface. 
and the number of executors is significantly reduced. There's actually a blueprint for, for this. Um, I created it and then like left it hanging for a few months. So I got to get back to it, but um, it's called executor reduction. You know, we don't really need like all of the SSH and shell, et cetera. For example, if you want to run locally, you can just use the static plugin and you can point to local host. And you can actually run it right here on your machine. Um, I want to pause real quick for questions before I jump into the demo. Is this kind of what I've, just, what I've made sense, make sense from an abstract sense? Hopefully, like, once we see the code, it'll start generating more, more questions. All right, cool. So I did install GDK on this, on this laptop because I knew I was going to be on an airplane for a little bit. Um, but I didn't end up using it. But everything else is running on this laptop. Um, what I'm going to do is I've got... I've got a configuration here um, that is an instance executor. So that means once I finally get inside there, I'm just going to do it, right? I'm not going to make it a Docker container. It's using the auto scaler configuration. Um, it's using the static plugin here. And the one that it's pointing to is localhost. Um, I'm running an SSH server. This is how I get in there. And I'm by also, I could I could just stop there and I could just run it on my Mac, right? But I want to actually put it inside of VM. So I'm pointing to um, what image I want to run here um, and where it is that I can access the nesting server. And how do I get inside of that? Now, at this point, I've already SSH into my Mac and I own my Mac, so it doesn't really matter that, you know, like I have a clear text password. So this is actually pretty much the same as what we've done for AWS Max, except for instead of having the static plugin, I would just have the AWS plugin and it would make those instances on demand. So there's, uh, and I just wouldn't have this, uh, instead of having um, a pointer to localhost, I would have a pointer to the instance group or the auto scaling group. So actually, when you jump between these various use cases, there's not a whole lot that changes. You just change the configuration for one that one aspect, um, which is kind of nice. So like you can understand how one part works, and you understand how to use it for all cases. Well, let's 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 run a job and see what happens here. All right. So I have, did some setup. What I've done is I've actually started up Runner here. Um, and I started up in Delve so I can debug it, and I put some debugging points in. Now, the way of leading works is it starts a separate process with the plugin. Um, so I, I started the plugin, and I attached to it as well. Like, the plugin gets started by Runner, so I had to attach to it afterwards. And I also am running nesting locally. Um, ignore that panic. That didn't happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'm running nesting locally, the server locally. That's that socket that I pointed to. Um, so I've got actually debug points through the whole process all the way up until we actually make the VM. So you can see what it actually looks like. So I'm gonna run a really simple job. Like my um, my config is, you know, hello runner, right? So I'm gonna, So I'm going to start a job, and I'm just going to look at the logs. And those logs are going to be updated as we step through this thing. But you'll notice the first thing that's happened is we've hit um, a prepare statement. Actually, notice that this is not, you know how I said this was the instance executor? But we're in this thing called executor's internal auto scale. I had something I was going to tell you. I forgot to tell you about it, but I'll come back to it right now. Um, there is this point here in the instance executor. The instance executor is very simple. You can see it's just like, you know, 123 lines. And when we register it, we actually wrap it in another provider. So we just grab the, so we sort of say, okay, you're going to run the instance thing, but we're going to also take this autoscaler provider and wrap it around it 
so that we can provide you as many of these as you want. So you'll see this same pattern again when I show you the Docker auto scaling. So the first prepare that we hit is actually inside the auto scale. So we, we, we start preparing the instance. The next thing that happens is it actually needs to get that instance. So it needs to get connect info. So if I come down here, now I'm inside the plugin and you can see I've called the plugin to say, okay, give me, you know, I've asked you to increase your capacity. Give me the connect info for this one. Um, so if I kind of step through here, you know, if I like step out and, and if I show you what it got, this is what it's given back 127, just kind of what you were expecting the local host, uh, the name and that key, right? So we're just going to continue from here. And then the next thing that happens is, um, now that, uh, we have this instance, uh, we're going now that we have this environment to run the job and we hit the prepare the inner prepare for the instance because we you know we wrapped it with this auto scale um so we keep doing we keep and as we go through this prepare um we get this environment and the environment is actually like uh from task scaler task scaler gave us this pointer to the instance that we own as a uh, a reference or sorry, as a, as acquisition, and we're, we we are using that and and um, calling prepare on it and actually running something inside of it. So here, when we run prepare, we go through a bunch of steps to sort of like set this thing up, and uh, which include like you know, um, uh, which include setting up VM isolation. So if you look up through this method here, auto scale prepare, we kind of it kind of like is it 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 gets then it gets us set up to this point where we're ready to return a connection. Because we prepare it, you get a connection, and then you take all the steps of the job and you just run them over that connection multiple times. Um, but here is this if statement, which is actually kind of an interesting point. So if VM isolation is enabled, right? Right now, this this uh, client represents a connection to the to my local MacBook, but not to anything in a VM, right? We haven't addressed isolation yet. So I have enabled it. So we're actually going further. So now I have this thing. So in the logs, we should see enforcing VM isolation. No, not yet. Hasn't, hasn't dumped it yet. Um, so now we're actually going to connect to the nesting service. So that socket that I pointed pointed to in the in the VM isolation, it's just a gRPC service running on my local MacBook that lets me create and delete VMs at will. And I don't even care what hypervisor it's using. It's the same gRPC interface. This is why nesting is its own separate aspect is because it's th through that interface. So I'm just going to say next, and I get a nesting client, and I can use that client to create a tunnel to the VM. So this gRPC interface is being provided by the plugins? Or? No, it's being provided by nesting. So nesting is another library. Yeah, so you've got the, you have the runner, you have fleeting, and fleeting just gives you capacity, right? And that capacity is this machine, like the whole machine. But if you want to put something inside, like a VM, that's another service provided by nesting. That's why I wanted to kind of focus on this conversation on the nesting part, is because we haven't really talked about it yet. Interesting, uh, created by us or by the... Yes. Yeah, by Aaron. <laughs> us -ish. There's a lot of yeah but it's a, it's it's in our code code base so if you go to GitLab or fleeting under fleeting there's task scaler which is the auto scaling there's the fleeting interface all the plugins and nesting and we're using nesting in production right now like this is how we're running max um so here ultimately i get to this part here where i'm going to call create on that nesting client right so now rather than hitting a breakpoint in um did they get an error no well that's interesting usually 
the demo did not hit the breakpoint that I was expecting. That's kind of funny. Usually what happens is um, you're actually going to like when you actually create the VM, I'll get a I'll hit a breakpoint here in the actually nesting server. And you'll see that it actually it says, OK, how do I want to do this? It's using Apple's virtualization framework. So it just there's multiple hypervisors built into nesting. Uh, and so the, the one that we're using in this case, like you can see uh, this plan mine parameter here is the virtualization framework. So I can I can actually access nesting um, as a command line tool. Like I have a cl command client here too, and I can just say list. And there's this VM here now, actually it's running, it started from that image. It has this IP address and port and that came back. So we kind of tunneled all the way in there in order to sort of, Get it. What process is running at that port in the VM? What process? Yeah, like an SSH server. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. it's runners, all SSH. SSH. Yeah, that's kind of a, yeah. a thing that's not changing. So it's actually, what's what's really interesting about this is if you step through the code, there's a point, as a matter of fact, I have this here in my notes, there's a point where you SSH or use WinRDM, right? Because mm -hmm. we have to deal with Windows. Um, and you hit that with nesting, you hit that twice. So um, let me just show you where that is. Here in fleeting connector connector, um, there's this dial function. And, and depending on you know which protocol you're using, it connects you. Mm -hmm. So when you're using nesting, you're going to hit this once, getting to the machine. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to get that client back. It's going to wrap it again in order to dial further into the VM in that machine. So you actually kind of come back through the mm -hmm. twice. Um, and I'm not going to show that with the breakpoints, but uh, it's good to know that it's there. And so then um, we hit run on the um, acquisition. You know, I was mentioning the acquisition is the thing we got back from task scaler. We sort of wrap it with some the code to sort of bolt it onto a job to run the things. And then um, now I am inside the executor running things and back to the acquisition. Cause there's, there's two rounds that like we actually do the job and then there's a second SSH to do the cleanup. Mm -hmm. You remember that? So, um, and that's, and that should be it. So the job succeeded. Did we get some logs? Yes, we did. So if you look at the logs, it kind of tells the same story here, right? Like we're, uh, we're running on uh, my, this is the runner, right? It's preparing an instance. Great. It's dialing GDK. Remember in the, in, in the, when I said local host, I gave it a name. I called it GDK. I'm not even using the GDK. So it's like <laughs> a bit of a bummer. I named everything that way, but it, it dials to there. Then it enforced the VM isolation. It created a tunnel for nesting, connected to the daemon, created the VM. Uh, then it dialed into the, um, yeah, somewhere, right? Yeah, so then it's actually running in here on that, <laughs> inside, inside, uh, and ran the thing. So so that's that's kind of how it would how it works with localhost running. I'm gonna show you actually now how what changes when you swap this out for something like cloud hypervisor. So cloud hypervisor is a um, a virtual manager, virtual machine manager that um, is kind of designed for modern cloud workloads. It doesn't emulate a lot of old hardware stuff. It's designed to be like lighter weight, built in rust to um, be efficient and, and secure. Uh, it supports Windows and it supports Linux. Um, when it comes to fleeting, we kind of want to have an unbounded list of plugins because people want to adapt any compute environment to this. For example, Apple wanted to use their, their proprietary compute environment. Um, I can't build them a plugin. I don't even have credentials. So I wouldn't be able to get them. So they just were able to just implement the interface and then adapt a runner auto scaling to their environment. And that, that was only responsible for getting SSH access to a machine somewhere. And then we pick it up from there. So plugins, fleeting plugins for capacity, we have an unbounded set, but hypervisors, not so much because hypervisors require a lot of investment, right? 
And they're, so they're actually more, um, it's a hard coded list, you know, because we have inside of nesting, there's a folder of, called hypervisors and we have one for tart, we have one for parallels. So we have to be strategic about which ones we pick. Mm -hmm. um, we were considering live vert, like I did a, a prototype of running live vert. I think that there's some advantages to, to getting a really good Linux hypervisor so that we can, um, like Aaron's desire is to build really big Linux VMs, make super fast rated local SSD, right? And then to recoup that cost by running a lot of VMs on there, running a lot of jobs. And we have to have that isolation because it's a SaaS service. That's why we need the VMs. <laughs> and we also are able to, to get a lot of concurrent use by having, you know, um, this isolation mechanism. So it's, it's there's a lot of interesting potential. So Cloud Hypervisor is one that we're considering supporting. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change to a different config. Um, I left myself some notes here so I wouldn't forget. All right. So Aaron got Cloud Hypervisor working on a big VM and gave me credentials. Um, so here I have, I'm pointing to a different machine. There's the external address, right? Um, and here is the username I should use, Aaron Walker, to get to it. And I gave him my key. And it's it's more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm still using the static one, but actually if you were if you wanted to do this in an auto-scaled mechanism, you would just need Aaron did a bunch of manual work to get this set up. You would just make sure that happens on boot, make that a template. And then instead of using the static plugin, you would use an odd, like one of the AWS or GCP plugins and point it to an instance group. And then he would just stamp these things out. And that's the only thing that would change. So here, not a lot changes from the previous config. So let's let's run this again. And this, before before I do, this one, there's, there is there is a one difference here, which is that this is a um, Docker autoscaler uh, executor. So here, when we finally get inside the environment, instead of just running our thing, we're going to start a Docker container and then I run our thing inside of there. So it's going to be in a VM, in a nested VM, in a Docker container. All right. And Docker, I don't even actually, I didn't even, we didn't even get into the details of Docker because it's adapted in the same way. So like, you remember how I showed you when we register instance, we did the same thing with Docker auto scaler. Just grab the same Docker executor that exists now, just slapped an auto scaling shell on it. And it works. It's not really, you can see 18 lines here. So let me, let me prove that it works. So I'm going to run another job. And we're, we'll step through it a little bit faster this time because you've you've kind of seen this, this you've well, you've already seen the same stuff. That's what's nice about this is you don't have to really like it's the same thing over and over again. Like we're going through the same steps. We get a reference that's super great. We enable VM isolation that's super great. We create a VM. Now I, I don't have I'm I, my plugin is still here locally. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Restart runner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do this. I, I, I even left myself a note to do this. All right. So I'm going to start, re, I'm going to restart runner and I'm going to start another job because um, you know how runner will dynamically load its config. We haven't implemented that all the way through the plugins. There's a, an issue that I created to add capabilities to that fleeting interface, like to reload config. So we should probably eventually get there, but we're not there yet. Okay. So now we're properly pointing at Aaron's machine. I don't have I will I don't have a debugger attached to his um, mm -hmm. fleeting or sorry his nesting server so we won't see that part. You didn't see it last time either, but that was fluke. It was supposed to happen. It totally happened last night. All right, so now we're gonna run we're gonna run this guy, and I'm actually not gonna put the breakpoints in. I'm just gonna let it let it just go. And you can see it's preparing an instance. 
ignore the TLS error, it's fine. It's doing some dialing. It created a VM. Oh, it stomped a previous VM because I rebooted Runner and Runner forgot what it was doing, but, but the nesting server did not. It knew that it has a specific capacity and these acquisitions, we've added slots to them, numbered zero through however many you want. And so if there's already a VM in that slot, it'll delete it for you. Um, this is just a way to make it resilient. So like runner can reboot and it, you won't like get stuck. And also nesting can reboot and you won't get stuck. All right. Did anything happen? Just, uh, CI status. I think I was watching the wrong one. But let's take a look at the logs and see if something properly happened. Okay, so we um, okay, we have a, a VM called Static Linux, right? We were pointing to that one. We enforced VM isolation. We are created the nesting VM. We created one and stomped one. It's just good to know. We're using the Docker executor. That's great. Using a helper image, we pulled the Docker stuff. And yeah, we're running on this. This bit right here is the name of the VM inside of that uh, inside that uh, GCE VM that that Aaron set up for me. So yeah, it's kind of kind of similar. And it ran hello world. So we'll be creating the VM called runner. runner. I mean, the virtual machine around the user, the, the credential to it. Is that correct? Can you say your question again? The okay. container, whatever job you did run. Yeah. It will be start into the VM called runner. Is that correct? Yeah. That's, yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. So basically, um, this is what happened. There's a there's a VM running. We SSH'd in there. We connected to the nesting socket, said, hey, create me a VM um, from this image. We created that VM. We just jumped into that one. And inside of that VM, there's a Docker process. And we connected to Docker process and said, start me a Docker container. And it started the Docker container and it did something. I don't really know how the Docker or Kubernetes executors work. So you can explain that to me. Next. Where there. do you specify the virtual the VM images? Uh, is, there, is that like a hard coded list or can you like they do you, are they pulled down or do they already exist on, on that machine? The images um or are they just whatever the the uh depends on where those images come from. It's actually like when the, the, the interface is like use this image and um the hypervisor itself could be configured to be able to run that from a local file, to pull it from ECR, okay, right. to do whatever. Um, so yeah, that's about configuring nested. So it's in the instance template or the whatever underlying image that you set up. I was hoping for like the list, but- um, yes, I, I guess whatever the cloud provider that you're on makes available. Um, or what we make available for ourselves. So like with Mac. Like we we have an infrastructure image and we have job images, and actually what we've done is we've transferred ownership of the job image to the uh, mobile DevOps team because they're the ones who actually like know how um, people want to build Mac stuff. Like I don't know what all the fibers are for. So um, Darby will create will will build this image that is has all the latest tooling that, that Mac developers want. He'll push it to ECR. And he'll give me a reference. And then when I build my AMI, my, my infrastructure image, I pull that down from ECR, bake it into my image, and then I use that AMI as like the instance template for our infrastructure. So it's like we bake it in. OK, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, questions? Um, how do you support the mobile user? Other plugins. So if they have a far or better, doesn't that increase the complexity of support because people may have certain plugins enabled or, or other? Uh, do you support these kind of software? 
That's a, that's a good question. So the question is just in case the recording didn't pick it up, how do you support, how do we support all these plugins, right? Like if somebody makes random plugin foo, how do I understand and support them? Yeah, or they come back and they say, hey, it's your code. Yeah, a well-defined interface, a well-defined gRPC interface and just one interface. Like we only have the one fleeting interface. So um, we have the most common ones we'll just officially support. GCP, AWS, Azure, probably the static one. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll we'll make sure those are running and we'll actually be dog footing them too. The others are just um, uh, self-service. And there's a pretty clear like delineation of responsibility with this GRPC mechanism. So and it's and it's the same thing over and over again. So if they tell me a problem, that is common to this whole infrastructure, I'll probably have seen it because I, I I manage like four plugins myself. So I know kind of generally how plugins work. So it's all about in, it, separating the dimensions and investing a lot of focus on one technology stack for those dimensions. Like we're gonna really understand the details of these fleeting plugins such that we can help people work through this quickly. That's a very narrow scope of uh, responsibility. Like, yes. You know, well, the interface is literally an SSH uh, instance, and you don't get that SSH instance to know the number. It's their problem there somewhere in there. Yeah. If you look at the the config that actually goes into the runner config, there's there's um, one for the plugin and one for the connection aspect, and those differ in an important way. The one that goes for the connection aspect all of the fields are typed, right? It's like you specify the protocol, you give me the external int internal address, a password or a key. So like, it's very clear what to do. The, the configuration for the plugin itself is passed through as a string string map and runner does not read that at all, has no connection to it. It's your way of configuring, of your, so your little space to configure your own plugin. So if it's in the plugin configuration, you should know what to put there based on the plugin that you've offered. Mm -hmm. If it's in the connector and stuff, well, it's the same as all the others. So we, we will tell you what to do. Any other questions? I have another question. Um, why, why is Docker at the, at the end of that? This is a little bit like more like how it, uh, rolls out as it executes to match the trace. Is that what is that what you mean like here? Like why here? Yeah, why or why again why are we using Docker and not more the end for example? Well a lot it, it this this is the executor is about like just like how do you want to run your job? Like how do you want to describe the thing to do? Do you want to run a shell script or put it in a Docker container? Um et cetera. So like if you if you say if you what you want to say is I want to run this executable, yeah. our supported ways, stick that in a Docker container and then you can start. Yeah, yeah. we'll pull it down for you. So it's, it's a way to run anything you want. But Docker doesn't provide isolation. I mean, like you can set this up so that you can run Docker on your on a machine with no isolation. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, or you can run it with isolation. So this. The paths through this matrix kind of tell you what all the possibilities. And this is an interesting topic of conversation, what to do down here. I think that- that uh, That's fuzzy for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these are sort of the paths that are that are known that we've executed, but I'm, I'm not convinced that we can't just do away with the, with this path here. Yes. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, I know, but like, I'm interested to continue that conversation. That's actually a very good segue. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop the recording here. On this Can I take your